Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Arnold Hirschhan, Associate Provost and University Librarian. I want to welcome you to this first colloquium on building a culture for a digital scholarship. Um, for the past six years, the Friedman Center has been a beacon for a digital activity on campus, and we're highly indebted to the Friedman family for enabling us to make many advances over the past six years. And we're very pleased that uh, two members of the Friedman family are going to be able to be joining us uh, today and tomorrow. One of them is already seated, Howard Friedman, back there, and Walter Friedman is on his way. Um, it was through the generosity of the Friedman family that we've been able to provide the university community with many services um, and to including digitization of material in all formats, loan of digital equipment, uh, particularly of interest to students, providing language learning services, and annually sponsoring the Friedman Fellows Program, uh, which has enabled early adopters of, in digital scholarship at Case to uh, learn more about and advance the use of digital scholarship here. Um, the growth of the Friedman Center continues. Uh, this past summer, we incorporated the statistics and geospatial data center within the Friedman Center walls. Um, and this fall, um, the visualization wall that you see over here um, was installed by Information Technology Services and we'll be working with ITS and with Baker Nord uh, Center for the Humanities and with others on campus to advance the use of the visualization wall over the next academic year. The impetus for this colloquium came from a conversation that I had actually last year with uh, Howard Friedman and uh, as in terms of a celebration of the work of the center, at that point it was, we were looking five years past, five years future, now we'll look six years past and six years future. Um, and to celebrate also the 95th birthday of uh, Walter and Howard's mother, Marion Friedman. Um, we missed the deadline a little bit in terms of being able to hit that celebration, but I am pleased that we're able to hold the colloquium today. The horizons for support of digital scholarship are ever expanding, and the point of this colloquium is to help foster the integration of new media, large data sets, high-end computing, and the many other digital technologies into that research and instructional process. Recently, I charged a visiting team of five distinguished individuals to review our work over the past uh, six years and point the way uh, for us towards what we should be thinking about to advance digital scholarship and the use of new media and instruction and where digital and digitization programs are going. The draft report of that team has been shared um, with university faculty in advance of discussions tomorrow and is being shared with, with our library staff as well. Building a culture for digital scholarship is not the sole responsibility of any one organization on campus and certainly not the sole responsibility of the library. We are a service and support unit we are interested in fostering the research and instruction of our faculty, and so that is our portion of the role. But within that context, we have a great interest in making sure that content and tools that our faculty and students need are available. The curriculum of this colloquium was designed not just by the library alone. It emerged from discussions with um, one of our key partners in the Friedman Center, the College of Arts and Sciences, and their representatives to this effort, Steve Hainsworth, the Associate Dean, and Tom um, Nab, Chief Information Officer for the college, and Tom's back there in the back row. In addition, Tim Robson from uh, KSL was also instrumental in the planning of this program. We're extremely pleased that the College of Arts and Sciences and University Informa Information Technology Services are co-sponsors of the program, and moving forward, uh, on the work of the Friedman Center, we can accomplish that only through the types of partnerships that we have had in the past and that we seek to foster in the future. As digital scholarship becomes a reality that is readily accepted, we are seeking to expand these partnerships even further to include all colleges of Case Western Reserve University and other offices such as uh, USIT, Undergraduate Studies, and Graduate Studies. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Laura Mandel, who is a professor of English and associate director of NINES, 
co-director of 18th Century Connect, an online community for 18th century literary scholars, and the director of the Initiative for Digital Humanities, Media, and Culture at Texas A&M University, where they must really like long titles. Um, and that, that um, center, th that initiative includes a new research consortium called the Advanced Research Consortium. Prior to that, um, and prior to going to Texas A&M, she was director of the Digital Humanities Program at Miami University of Ohio. So with that short introduction, I bring you Laura Mandel. Thank you, Laura. Let me introduce myself a bit before launching into possible definitions and classes of digital scholarship by giving you a bit of my history as a digital humanist. I began working in 1994 on the Romantic Chronology with Alan Liu, and for that reason was included in discussions starting around 2003 about launching nines. Jerome McGann started the networked infrastructure for 19th century electronic scholarship in order to make it possible to search across all the major digital projects in the field of 19th century literary studies. But also, primarily, as he explains in a forthcoming article in Profession 2011, in order to provide a peer reviewing mechanism for scholars in the field. Without an adequate reward structure, McGann reasoned, young scholars would be unwilling to create digital scholarly resources, unable more than unwilling, since it would involve risking their careers. In 2008, I began 18th Connect, a sister organization to Nines. It will be officially launched with some major additions to the model at ASEX 2011, the conference in San Antonio. Sorry, ASEX 2012. Nines and 18th Connect allow searching across a federated collection of archives who share metadata. And we then supplement that search with metadata from journals, special collections, and proprietary digital resources in the field, providing a comprehensive research environment for scholars in both 19th and 18th century studies. We offer peer review for projects via editorial boards as illustrious as those found at Cambridge University Press, for instance. That enables us also to set standards for digital work. We primarily follow the MLA guidelines for electronic scholarly editions. As part of telling you about my background, I'll just briefly outline the definition of digital scholarship that I'll be exploring in this session based on three documents. The guidelines offered to 18th, at 18th Connect, and these are them, to those who are submitting digital projects for peer review, and two very release, recently released, hot off the press, the screen, sorry, uh, digital uh, documents by Lisa Spiro. Um, you mentioned this, where are you, Bill? Yeah. Um, and so, um, uh, two um, hot off the screen documents by Lisa Spiro, director of, um, or uh, she's actually director of Nightly now, and Todd Pressner, director of the UCLA Digital Humanities Center. First and foremost, digital media must not be incidental, but integral to scholarly work. Digital scholarship is not, in other words, scholarship that takes place in digital media. All the digitized journal articles in JSTOR and Project Muse do that. And most ebooks might as well be books. In fact, it would be a lot more convenient if they were. They wouldn't need batteries. Um, if publishing in a paper involves no loss of functionality, then my advice to scholars is publish it in paper. The implications of this principle are twofold. First, this knocks out of the running any digital project in which a scholar acts as a content provider and drops his or her work off at the door of IT services. Second, it means that digital scholarship by its very nature requires collaboration. And so we must have peer reviewing mechanisms that take that into account. Let me just emphasize the potential catch 22 here. If you publish something online that is really, in its core idea, a print artifact, P&T committees and peer reviewing bodies, such as the editorial boards at 18th Connect and Nines, will say, you just made a digital edition because no one would publish this work. But conversely, 
If you pursue digital scholarship for the sake of finding out what can be done in new media, it requires collaborating with designers, computer programmers, real collaboration of the sort sponsored each year through summer fellowships funded by the NEH and sponsored by the online journal Vectors at USC. If it really fits that mold, P&T committees threaten to say collaboration doesn't count. Though positively reviewed by book list and library journals, I was not allowed to put forward the romantic chronology as part of my tenure case. Luckily, I had also published a traditional book. To get back to the first appreciation, it is sometimes the case that no one would publish scholarship that deserves to be published. I'm technical editor of Linda Pratt's amazing e-collection of Robert Southey's letters, coded and published by Romantic Circles. And I have a great story about why those letters were published digitally. Linda was being interviewed on the BBC about her work. Linda Bree, acquisitions editor for Cambridge University Press in the field of Romantic Studies, was listening to the interview and began to walk to the phone to call Linda Pratt to say that she would publish it. The interviewer asked Linda the extent of the collection. It's huge. We have 877 letters, TEI encoded and up in Romantic circles, and we've only published parts one and two of the eight-part edition. Linda hung up the phone before making the call. <laughs> there are also, of course, lesser known poets, the publishing of whom no press can risk financially. In these cases, the editing must be as rigorous as with any print edition, and it is still a requirement that the editor, fi editor figure out collaboratively how to exploit the digital medium. I'll end my talk by showing you what we've done with the Salvi letters, in instead of just printing it. Second, in broad outline, before I get to details and specific projects, the work must be coded according to community standards. This motivates Lisa Spiro's beautiful outline about how to find out what is going on in the field of digital humanities and how to stay informed. The MLA guidelines say explicitly that an electronic scholarly edition must use community standards. I'm not sure if I have that up. No. Um, must use community standards or defend the decision not to do so on intellectual grounds. The demands of conforming to community standards, the demands of proper encoding and design, of scholarship that can be used with tools and software being developed by digital humanists, this in my mind is what takes research beyond merely being an equivalent, an equivalent to a scholar's own personal three by five cards. There's a moment when you have a manuscript in draft and then you must go through all the rigors associated with print publication. There's an analogous moment in digital scholarship when after you've rig rigorously collected, curated, and annotated your textual data, you must make it fly in the digital world. I still remember attending the first nine summer workshop in 2005 to work on creating my own poetess archive, which up until then had been static HTML pages of bibliographies. Bethany Novisky held a seminar on site design in which she said, okay, what would any scholar expect to be able to find coming to a site with this title? And how can you design your site to make that possible? What research questions would they ask? Sketch out how your site will work to make it as easy as possible for them to answer their questions when they come there. It's not just that at that moment, I realized that my site had to be a database, enabling categorizing and searching for bibliographic information in ways that I hadn't sorted it in my static pages. In a sense, that's really the equivalent of a publishable bibliography as opposed to simply taking down bibliographic information in your own personal notes. But it went beyond that because I realized what information needed to be there that wasn't there yet. In my case, all the tables of contents of literary annuals and periodical poetry. I'm only halfway there. That's what takes a project from being notes to myself to being digital scholarship, imagining what others need to know, what questions they will ask, and creating a resource accordingly. Here, crucially, is the place that digital editions and archives, as they are now called, differ from failed publications. But it is also where the mind of the scholar moves toward that of the librarian and that of the press. 
I have trouble answering traditional scholars who say, ah, leave that work to the library. And I would love to, to discuss with all of you the differences between how scholars curate data and how librarians do it. I also have trouble parrying the, uh, the charge against the charge leveled by digital humanists such as Dan Cohen that these digital archives are just boutique projects modeled on the ethos established by Harold Bloom of the literary critic as a priest of high culture. I'll just run through the major projects with which Nine started aggregating data, and you can see major additions. The Rossetti Archive, Jerome McGinn's the Rossetti Archive, the William Blake Archive, and you can see here that it was approved and is an electronic uh, scholarly edition by the MLA and also won a prize for a distinguished scholarly edition of any sort, not just um, digital. And um, the Whitman Archive, they were the three major. Um, Cohen, let's see, yes, Cohen would like us to stop creating what he calls silos and what we call thematic research collections and instead build what he calls network scale systems. The way I've been talking about digital scholarship makes it sound as if it is all a matter, matter of editing and that's partly because the projects I have been involved in are primarily additions. So here's the letters of Robert Bloomfield um, that I was technical editor for, the collected letters of Robert Southey. That's it, I think I, there's a few others you'll see along the way. Um, let's see, digital media have transformed ours into what Jerome McGann and Greg Crane call the great age of editing not simply because it enables editor to, editors to do things that they have never been able to do before, such as get all copies of Blake's individually hand, watercolored, illuminated manuscripts on the same virtual table for in-depth comparison, despite the fact that they live at the Huntington, the Tate, the Fitzwilliam, as well as private collections, and without risk of spilling water on any of them. It is also the great age of editing because anyone can join the curatorial process. We can, as Greg Crane is doing and proposes to do, get undergraduate students involved in, quote, editing the entire record of humanity. I'm still quoting him. If we move towards community-driven models of updating and preserving editions, preserving the original contributions within a versioning system, but allowing the documents to evolve as their authors pursue their careers. The, these additions can serve as starting points rather than as fixed and obsolescent snapshots." End quote. I'm quoting Greg Crane's paper given at a Mellon-funded event called The Shape of Things to Come, hosted by Jerry McGann at UVA in 2010. All these papers are online. I'm quoting uh, Dan Cohen's paper from there as well, and will simply disagree with him, as Kenneth Price did, that we can let digitization happen via Google Books or even the Internet Archive and Hathi Trust, and then capitalize upon this huge amount of data. That can be done, but that, that's not all that's needed. Decontextualized information and information improperly coded is as good, is as good as, or even at times worse than, no information at all but I'll spare you that diatribe. <laughs> because of that belief, a group of us are trying to grow the nines model. I now direct ARC, the Applied Research Consortium, which is trying to get nines-like entities for specific periods off the ground. And we are participating with the newly funded Hathi Trust Research Center and Bamboo Corpora Space in order to provide our users with not only texts but tools in which to manipulate them and a workflow or process for managing their research. So um, I'll now show some examples of digital scholarship that I think are cutting edge before discussing similarities and differences between traditional and digital scholarship. This is Thought Mesh. And um, it uh, was one of the vector projects that was launched. What it enables people to do is to upload their articles into it and get them tagged along with other articles so that you can start searching among um, an oeuvre. And it's whoever comes can put their things in there. You could go put your things in there now. So if you search for preservation, as librarians are sometimes 
wanting to do, you'll come up with um, all the articles in there, uh, snippets where the word appears or where, that have been tagged that way. Um, this is Todd Presner's HyperCities project. This is HyperCities Egypt, and it was fed by a Twitter stream during the Arab Spring um, and uh, the, um, the protests against Mubarak in, in Cairo. And you can see that there's a Twitter stream. If you go there and play it, it plays, and you can make it play fast or slow. Uh, it shows you where the, um, the, the twi tweet is coming from on the map and then what it said, and you can see it moves through the map um, as you um, progress through. Uh, I think some of these had to be taken down because people were in danger, uh, and so there were some security issues there. HyperCities began as a mapping of Germany um, through time and showing um, Berlin through time and showing different uh, you know, of course, buildings and structures and, and overlaying historical maps onto Google Earth. But it's grown um, to where it, it, it actually maps all different kinds of cities. And so there's this software core there that Todd Pressner developed, and then a whole lot of people are taking that core and using it. Imagine peer reviewing that for tenure. <laughs> Lev Manovich, um, who's a great visualization artist, uh, has done an analysis of time through time, Time Magazine through time. Here you can see it, uh, and you can really see, you can get some information about the history of Time Magazine from this amazing visualization. I wish I had it over there, maybe sideways. Okay. <laughs> um, this is the virtual light box developed by Matt Kirschenbaum. So now we're talking about um, digital scholars working on software. Uh, software is one digital project. Uh, this virtual light box is what was used, and I think you can see an instance of it there, to uh, look at the pictures the, the William Blake um, in the William Blake archive uh, and to create them in all kinds of forms that are usable. Juxta is an, another amazing piece of software developed by Jerome McGann at Nines and Nick Lyacona, uh, who's a computer scientist. And I'm publishing an article by Nick and uh, a scientist on Juxta in the POTES Archive Journal next round. This is um, an amazing piece of equipment which can actually do what uh, traditional editors do in terms of collation in a matter of seconds. And when you show it to people, they get nauseous <laughs> because they spent years. Uh, here it is. This is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, and when you output it, it gives you a traditional collation scheme. But what you see there are um, instances of differences in the 1818, between the 1818 and the 1831 edition. And here's a collation histogram showing you where all three editions differ most strikingly. So you can click on those and go to those parts. You can also ad adjust the level of granularity. If you don't want to you know, just look at a difference where a the is, has been inserted, uh, you won't have to. Um, and then um, it, it's now being made, thanks to two grants from Google, into a web application. So you'll be able to go online very soon and drop, it in, drop your texts into a web application. Uh, check back at Nines for that or at Juxta. This is my baby. <laughs> this is a uh, crowdsource correction tool. The biggest problem with 18th century texts is uh, called Echo. <laughs> 18th century collections online, and it's an amazing resource, 182,000 texts. And I love working with Gale Send Gage Learning, but it's, it, it's a resource that was made from microfilm that was made from scans done in the 70s. So you can imagine the quality of the images. What that means is that you can't really full text search this resource the error level is too high. And that's, again, where Dan Cohen and I disagree. 70% is not good enough to me, nor I imagine to most of my digital humanities colleagues. We should talk about scholars, digital human, or humanities scholars and correctness um, at some point, because I think that's definitely part of the mind of the scholar. So this is a crowdsource correction tool. It's just been released in beta. We have 40 power users banging on it, trying to make it break, and um, correcting as many texts as they can in um, the Dale, uh, Gale database. Um, when you're working on software and tools and design of that sort, it's not that you're not doing something intellectual. You are. In fact, you are realizing the theory, uh, assumptions, 
disciplinary um, adages, you're realizing them in practical form. And I love this, um, this is a, a Dutch scholar, um, I don't know how to say his last name, but um, he says, uh, don't, when you're building something, don't think of designing instructions for something you build, Thinking, think of building it so that it is instructive as built. Now, if you are a scholar trying desperately to eliminate the amount of text you have to, to give people to use it, chances are that other scholars may not appreciate um, all the thought that went into that one little button. Uh, right now, for instance, our biggest problem is that check mark. <laughs> because uh, people um, click on it and they think it's going to save uh, what they saw, but it actually says the original was right. It's a very confusing icon. Um, and so we have lots of problems with that. This is an unfortunately named tool. <laughs> Don't Google it. <laughs> uh, called Voyeur Reveal Your Texts, um, created by Stephen Sinclair and Jeffrey Rockwell. It's an amazing thing. It's an, a window where you can just upload texts and do all kinds of fairly complex um, linguistic analysis. Here's um, Adam Smith's uh, theory of moral sentiments, if you didn't recognize it. Uh, it's not leather bound, but um, you can see a, a whole lot of information about this, uh, this text. Uh, you can see I've searched for the word sentiments, which is uh, big there in the word cloud. Here's um, the text itself and where it appears so that you can zoom in to the micro reading from the macro. Here is a graph of how often the term sentiment appears. I'd actually like to have sentiment and sentiments up there at the same time and compare them. And you can do that in this tool. And then um, you can have... Um, uh, information about the context and you can also expand that information it's a, 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 this tool beautifully balances macro with micro analysis close reading with distant reading I know you probably know some of you about the distant reading debates led by Franco Moretti this is um, oh this is um, William Gibson uh, the Agrippa project that was um, created by Alan Liu and uh, Matt Kirschenbaum. It's an amazing multimedia resource about an artist's poem that was made to disappear. You, uh, I don't know if any of you know about it, but you, um, it was a, it was on the little floppy disk. It was back then, and um, people would, you, if you, when you inserted it into the computer, it would run through once and then self-destruct. And so um, it's been recreated by um, uh, a number of people. This is a blog by Ted Underwood, who. It, has written my favorite article on PMLA. I mean, this is a genuine literary scholar. And he's learned Python, taught himself Python programming, and is working on topic mapping and topic um, modeling and trending, uh, all of these things that he understands better than I do. But the thing that's amazing about this work is that what you'll be able to do with topic mapping I've seen so many people present the Google Ngram Viewer. How many of you are familiar with the Google Ngram Viewer? Yeah, I'll show, I'll show it to you at some point if you want to see it. But so many people use the Google Ngram Viewer and they say, let's find out what the 18th century thought about um, capitalism. And they type in the word capital. Well, the problem with that is 18th century people didn't call capital capital. They did sometimes. But they mostly called it stock. It's throughout the wealth of nations, it's called stock. It's money, but it's stock, OK? It's the kind of money that's stock. Actually, that's a good definition of capital. Um, and so if you want to search for wholesaling in the 18th century, you've got to search for sale by sample. So in case you don't have an 18th century expert sitting right next to you while you're searching, how are you going to know? And what about the things that we experts don't know that we want to discover? This is an opportunity to learn that. And what Ted Underwood has done and has written about is he tried topic modeling using some terms and discovered that in novels, um, words about emotion were highly correlated with words about time. This is another insight, a new one, into the way that the linear temporal structure of the novel works to structure or to um, create even certain kinds of emotions. Um, so this is where I think new ideas are coming from this kind of research. But you have to be very careful. You have to know what data went in. You have to know how this thing works. You have to know what it's showing you. And I think digital humanists in general feel very uncomfortable. The director of Nines, Andrew Stauffer, said to me, I just told Rich this, um, I know how to read a text, 
but I don't know what to do when I look at that. And so digital humanists feel uncomfortable. They haven't had the statistics classes for reading graphs. They don't know what, what's, what it's doing. They have no way of knowing. So they feel very uncomfortable. And then some people are just too confident. <laughs> they start making wild generalizations from this. And you, you don't want that either. So um, it's, a, it's a hard um, nut to crack in thinking about how the scholarly mind must evolve for new uh, kinds of things. This is an experiment that was undertaken with Franco Moretti at the Lit Lab at Stanford. And Michael Whitmore, who is now a director of the Folger, a Shakespeare scholar, was working on it. I call it a failed experiment. Um, you should read through it and see what you think. Um, it's, an, it's an attempt to um, determine genre by uh, uh, machine methods, automated methods. And I think it fails uh, largely. Uh, I do think it's really important that we tried that. Uh, there's this wonderful article by John Unsworth called The Importance of Failure. And so how do you judge that for tenure? You know, what if you say, well, this was a colossal failure, but I learned not, we learned not to, to go that route anymore and maybe saved you know, 10 years of worth of work by proving that this can't be done this way. Well, how do you judge that? Um, you can't put it between covers, really. The creator of Thought Mesh, I'm going to talk about similarities and differences now between uh, traditional scholarship and digital scholarship, from my point of view, obviously. <laughs> um, the creator of Thought Mesh, John Ippolito, worries that scholars will not take advantage of new media, that will fail to create digitally born scholarship, that what we put on the web will not differ from what we did in print. There are similarities, as John Unsworth has beautifully demonstrated in his article on scholarly primitives. But there's one real difference that, to me, makes all the difference. This partly motivated what I said about Medium earlier. As Unsworth himself repeatedly points out, computers are modeling machines. And what we do with them as scholars is model our cultural heritage. Dino Buzzetti and others have taken the textual encoding initiative, it's a, it's a consortium of people figuring out how to code humanities documents, um, to task for trying to imagine that there's a clear separation between form and content, that the fact of digitizing does not itself affect the text being, um, affect the text being represented. As Buzzetti argues in an essay in New Literary History, textual encoding or markup is representation of structure and at the same time is itself a structure. Creating digital archives of high scholarly quality requires being faithful to the text or the data or the artwork that you're modeling on the computer, but it also interjects into that data new principles of structuration. Here's a concrete example from my own Poetess archive, a poem by Maria Abdi called The Poetess. It's presented here as a web page and here as a mobile text. Presenting it across platforms requires TEI encoding it. And encoding it requires transforming it into something it is not, a hierarchical structure in which hierarchy bears meaning. A document marked up semantically, uh, a, a document coded with information that fits it into prosopographies or uh, analysis of people who are involved, and ontologies, uh, definitions of what counts as literature, for one thing, that allow it to be searched. The components of digital editions analyze them differently than do the components of print editions for the sake of making it possible to manage them differently in new technologies. And all those differences need to be laid out and articulated in order for us to know that what we're doing, what we're doing. And it's not an easy task. So I would submit to you that the database, the way I structured it, and the search reflects a theory uh, about the way poetry is modeled in the 19th century, a theory about poetry collections, uh, which I've written about and is, forms one chapter of my book, my printed book, 
where I discuss what constitutes an, a disciplinary anthology as opposed to a literary annual or a collection of poetry. Um, this lives that theory or does it or practices it. But if I didn't have the book, would you be able to know? Um, OK, and now I'll discuss future trends. For me, one of the most exciting trends is combining book history with digital scholarship as a way of better understanding both, a way of understanding how structures affect the cultural artifacts that they model. This is um, the Inky Project, which is um, funded by Shirk and is doing amazing things in, in sort of using book history to analyze digital objects. Here are some things that scholars can do at nines. Another future um, that's partly, partly enacted. You can collect and tag items, dis discuss with other people, and share your research on nines now. Although people do not take advantage of tagging that much, but WorldCat has something similar. That's old news. Um, you're going to be able to correct the text that you see that's running uh, search engines. And you're going to be able to discover what is running search engines um, from 18th Connect. You're going to be able to do data mining and publish your results. Data mining um, is uh, organizing various kinds of processes that you want to be able to use to analyze texts is coming. This is um, the engine that runs the Monk project some of you may have heard about. And this is um, a newspaper project, uh, Richmond Civil War newspapers, uh, that allows amazing kinds of data mining. Um, let's see. The monograph, as it migrates to digital media, will no longer be the same if it is useful and usable. First, it will need to incorporate other people's work if it's going to deliver on a promise of comprehensiveness. You can see here that this monograph starts to incorporate other people's work. This has led to several working groups formulating new notions of authorship and crediting systems. This was uh, written by the attendees at the Nines Summer Institute, which is about evaluating digital scholarship. And um, this is a collaborator's Bill of Rights that was written by Bethany Novisky and some other people. She is also the editor of Alt-Ac, um, Alt Academy, which is about new kinds of positions that are opening up for humanists in the academy who don't want to go the tenure track route, but want to work in digital media. Second, the works we as scholars produce must become malleable as has been beautifully imagined by Jeffrey Rockwell and Stephen Sinclair in their creation of Voyeur. Voyeur allows people to go to a place and analyze data, as I've already shown you, but it also allows a person to incorporate into scholarly essays living, breathing data. How are librarians going to preserve this? I look at Melanie. Help me, Melanie. Sorry. <laughs> oh, how are librarians going to preserve this? I don't know. OK, um, so in a, in a special issue of the Poetess Archive Journal, um, which is now moving forward. Uh -huh. Sinclair and Rockwell include this living window, clustering terms from their own article. It, oops, wrong way. It loads up, I don't have it live, it loads up when you go to the article. It's animated, it's moving around um, when you go there. And you can move things around in it to sort of see the clusters and, and manipulate them. But most amazing, you can abandon their searches, their search constraints, and search on your own. I typed humanities up there. Within their article, the voyeur window changes articles from frozen text to little laboratories where others can try things, explore, play. I mean, how many times have you read a book where you say, yes, that's true from 1823 to 1825. But if you took 1826 into account, you know, it wouldn't hold. And um, you have to write a notes and queries article, write a book review, at which it sounds a little snarky that you're just quibbling over one year. But you actually want people to know this, right? That there's a different, um, a different thing to be seen in those years. Now you can do it. And there's software on, coming on in the future that will allow you to save your argument right there with that article article as opposed to having to publish it somewhere else. I'm just going to close um, now 
by showing you what can be done with an edition that was simply printable but now has been digitized. And so I'm going back to the Saudi letters here. This diagram shows all the people named in Saudi's letters. I'll narrow it down now by non-family. And only those who are mentioned and written to a lot. I don't know if this means anything to anybody, but I've selected 13 and, and above K cores. Um, doesn't, it took me a long time to figure it out, and people had to explain it to me many times, my collaborators. Um, if Saudi wrote to Coleridge, he's here, Coleridge, a dot, you can see him right there. Um, but because Saudi could have, could of course, mentioned the King of England in a letter, without Coleridge having a real relationship to that person, we have indicated those names who are never themselves written to, but are mentioned with a unidirectional arrow. Thus, if all the letters talking about, uh, are talking about King George, but he's never written to, there will be a bunch of little arrowheads by his name. Sometimes you're written about, and, and the person that you are written about you, is never written about to you. So that's what happens with some of the arrows. But there'll be a whole lot of them if you're never written to. You can see that the publisher, Joseph Cottle, is somewhat a figurehead, mentioned a lot, but he also participates in the Lake Poet Coterie. Notice here the appearance of George Dyer. His prominence in the Romantic era confirms the thesis of a Romanticist, Nicholas Rowe, who argued that even though Dyer didn't publish much, his ideas were central to the Lake Poets in their early years. Also, we've looked at betweenness centrality, which means that Coleridge, who has the highest amount of it, is mentioned in letters to people who are also mentioned to him in letters from Saudi. He's socially a center of attention, socially connected to most of the addressees. And here you can see who is King George. Longman, the publisher, talked about to everyone, but never written to about anyone in the circle, set apart, idolized. The kind of counting, this kind of counting and visualizing does in, indeed confirm something we know. George Dyer's influence, Joseph Cottle's participation, Coleridge's friendships, though it makes these facts salient in a way that they have never been before. And it also shows us something we didn't know, something about Longman's functioning, and consequently, of the, something about the history of publishing as a social phenomenon. Longman differs remarkably from Cottle and Joseph Johnson, two publishers who dined, encouraged, funded, babysat, I mean, everything, um, and stimulated the authors. Um, Longman, I would like to suggest, as I will now research after having looked at this um, representation, um, Longman may be the first of the distinctively modern booksellers insofar as he establishes his cap cultural capital by remaining aloof. And it's, of course, that system of cultural capital that we need to overcome in expanding into digital humanities. That's all I wanted to show today, and I hope we can have some good discussion about the things I have shown and my primary claims about the scholar's mind, which I'll just re reiterate that we are approaching new knowledge not simply through changes in scale, as Dan Cohen argues, although we are doing that, but because we are modeling cultural artifacts differently than we did in print. That making things usable and comprehensive, designing our scholarship for others to use, is an innovation devoutly to be wished, that it enhances scholarly rigor rather than decreases it. And that the great age of digital editing is involving us in collaborations and hence in redefining authorship in deeply fundamental ways. Also, also from my perspective, a boon. Thank you. Uh, different kinds of organizations and communities. Do you see 
the emptiness of the anti-war traditional scholarship, or is this, you know, again, this some better avenue than, say, a journal article that's going to be well, I mean, I think that's a really, really good question. And I actually have to write an article about that. Right, I'm working on it right now, as you can tell, because I'm so involved in it. Um, I think what your question gets at is both a problem and um, what we might call um, something residual. Um, the, the problem is that you cannot interpret, interpret graphs and tables and diagrams in the way that you interpret literature. And I think that's what befuddles people. So I'm doing a very dangerous thing uh, in doing that. Um, I think if I, if I didn't have so much background, I wouldn't do it. If I didn't, you know, hadn't read Nicholas Rowe's book and, 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 and knew. Um, what that also shows, though, is that when you start working with digital projects that are not textual as a digital humanist, you use algorithms. and the criterion for their success is that they match your expectations as an expert. So in other words, when you're doing um, authorship attribution, right, what you'll do is you'll have this machine that tries to figure out who wrote this text, and then you'll have the expert. And the expert will say, it was Daniel Defoe. And the machine agrees with the expert, and so yes, the algorithm works. Well, what does that do for you in terms of new knowledge? Nothing much, right? It just means that, OK, I'm getting my machines to look more like experts, but I'm not learning anything. So um, then you've got those things that you expected as a scholar, which sort of validates the algorithm. You'll see in the Lit Lab pamphlet that it didn't, didn't work. Um, then what you have, if you've got that algorithm that does really well, is you've got outliers, right? And sometimes the outliers are flukes. The machine just did something weird. Somebody coded something weird. They're just flukes. And sometimes they're really interesting. You know? So the thing that you didn't expect will either be a mistake or really interesting. And you as a scholar have to go back, I think, and use all your traditional scholarly methods of interpretation to find that. I think that makes me a dinosaur. I don't think that the new generation is going to think that way. I think um, they're going to have other things that they do. So. Ask about the new generation and the persistence of particular dis disciplinary dispositions in economies of prestige. Yeah. I work a lot with, with graduate students in English, uh, especially training them in research methods. And uh, in the past, I've, I've taken them into the library and they've done some XML coding. And uh, I've had undergraduate students use uh, the Live at Home um, tool. I can see that in the 90s yeah. anymore, perhaps that's gone away. No, it's there. Um, <laughs> But what I've sort of discovered is that they want to make use of these tools. Um, but they see themselves primarily as critics, not as scholars. And so there are still all the old barriers uh, to um, getting people to take on things like textual scholarship and wanting to do additions as opposed to uh, the sort of higher prestige, at least in their uh, uh, perceptions, of writing the article, of writing the monograph, and those kinds of things. So I wonder if you can talk about those kinds of obstacles, because really to do these kinds of projects, you need not just to master these new tools, but also really the old tools as well. And it's frankly far easier and far more prestigious uh, to be the very visible uh, sort of critic uh, than the really solid scholar. Absolutely. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think um, you know, a lot of the battles that Jerome, again, has been fighting in all of his articles is the denigration of editing and textual scholarship in our discipline. Um, and he does a good job of being a high-profile critic as well as an excellent textual scholar. Um, but um, that is a problem. And um, in another, another way that that precisely feeds into this whole issue is that because we don't recognize editors in our discipline typically as critics, as interpreters, because we don't recognize the act of editing as an act of interpretation, it's very difficult to see a database as an act of interpretation. It would be much easier if you could, you know, look at the really look at the footnotes and see, you know, what um, David Erdman is doing with Blake um, in in the complete William Blake. You know, how is he construing this? Um, Hans Walter Gobbler says there are there are huge numbers of research articles hidden in editorial apparatus that the editors themselves have not brought out, not had the time to do. Maybe it's too time consuming. I don't know. There's something about the disciplinary structure. But I'll tell you what makes me really suspicious, and you hit on the 
the nail on the head here. What makes me really suspicious is that everything that we denigrate in our discipline is set against doing this work. You know, like, I, I would call that um, dangerous. So editing is denigrated. The sciences, the more we approximate the sciences, we're sellouts or empiricists, uh, positivists at the worst. Um, that, you know, um, visualizations aren't um, privileged. Mathematical literacy is denigrated. Um, the arguments between um, uh, Katie Trumpener and uh, Franco Moretti are just enthralling because they are really the discipline coming in to quelch an interest in disciplinary, in, in digital humanities. And I just find that very worrisome. I find it worrisome because I don't think we edit things the way that librarians would do. I don't think that all that has to be done should be done by libraries or even can be done by libraries. Uh, and I think that much of what we care most deeply about will be completely lost if we're not involved, if our undergrads are not involved. That's my apocalyptic speech. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was wondering, sort of on the other end of that, Kurt Schiff did a rather nice uh, editorial last week in the Council of Higher Education called Cit Citation Obsession Get Over. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And, um, you know, that we're making, we're making students crazy. And librarians are having to take on entire jobs. And the example he uses is, how do I quote a limerick in the upstairs bathroom? <laughs> and that you know we are, we are we are spending so much time having them learn these things that they're they're they lost the joy. It's so It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you mentioned grants grants a couple of times. How expensive is the grant? Funding versus an academic scholarship versus a computer scientist who's doing it from school. Yeah, I think that the grant funding structure is what has replaced the culture of prestige in the digital humanities. So if you can say, I got a Mellon grant, you can get tenure for something. And I do think that a lot of the digital humanities is largely, has largely been structured by Mellon grants. You know, what, um, what we see, it's, a, it's a form, another form of publication. So that's a really good point. I, I think as digital humanists, and another thing that makes my literally makes my skin crawl as a humanist, is we need to collaborate with businessmen. And the only thing that I question in my own skin crawling thing is, because, you know, I, I gave up money and love for money and love for material things to become a professor, allegedly. Um, and um, I would like new shoes. Oh, sorry. Uh, at any rate, <laughs> um, so, you know, the, um, that problem is, um, the problem is, is that we, we take the money if it's like a robber baron who's dead, you know, if it's Mellon or Carnegie or whatever, um, but we, we won't take it if it's a business that's alive, you know? And so I, I think we need to look at these disciplinary structures and how they're inhibiting us and, and, uh, and why, why we have these knee-jerk reactions. I do have them. Was, did that answer your question or? No. Could I have a follow-up? Yeah. Like do you any like of these proprietary sources donate content versus monetary funding or anything like that? Yes. Um, sometimes they do, and we need to d have them do it more. But the the um, contract that I worked out with Gail Sengage Learning, which I have to say I'm thrilled about. So Echo Catalog, really expensive, right? It's unaffordable for some universities. And the deal I worked out with them is that anybody who comes to, well, right now, when you go to 18th Connector 9s and you click on a resource, if your library doesn't subscribe, you don't get in. You know, if you're not on proxy server, not in the building, not, or not on proxy at home. Um, so your library has to subscribe to the resource. That's how they keep their money. So we just index it by full text and people find it, but then to click on it and get to it, they have to subscribe. They have to subscribe to JSTOR, to Project Muse, all of those things. Well, um, there's a whole, there threatens to be a digital divide in our community. There's a whole group of scholars at universities that can't afford Echo. You can't be an 18th century scholar these days without Echo. You just can't. So what the deal I worked out, I'm really proud of this, is if you go in and you crowdsource correct a document, you get it. So Gail gives it to you. We give it to you in digital form. We give it to you as an XML document, a TEI encoded document, TEIA or TEIL. We give it to you as plain text. We give you lessons on how to make a digital edition if you want to come to a summer workshop. Um, and we write, we peer review it and write letters for promotion and tenure um, so that people who um, need to get tenure but want to read those 17 sermons 
can make digital editions, get them peer reviewed, and get tenure. Um, it's, it's really exciting to me. People worry that I sold out too much because all of the corrected data goes back to Gail Sengage. But who wants to search bad data? I mean, those of us who are paying millions of dollars for it don't want to search bad data either. You know? So, so uh, they're not going to fix it. They've already sold the catalog. I don't know. Collaborations with business are very difficult to, f to think through. And, um, but they're, I, think they're, I think we will get something back from the business community. I think right now, a lot of them are holding our cultural heritage, and we need to help them hold it well. Yeah. I guess just because I'm a literary scholar. Okay, so there isn't anything particularly good about MLA for the community. No, in fact, I had to write an XSLT that transformed TEI into MLA style, and as far as I know, I'm the only one who did it, and it almost drove me mad. <laughs> so forget the MLA style. <laughs> Go to APA or whatever. Yeah. No, I was really heartened. The Nine Summer Institute, which is, um, uh, is running again this summer, but was also running last summer, is on evaluating digital objects for promotion and tenure, or digital work of any sort for promotion and tenure. And um, what we thought, we, we brought in for the first summer, NEH Summer Institute, we brought in um, provosts and deans. And then the second one is going to be primarily chairs. There were a few chairs the first summer. If you know a chair who should go, by all means, apply. It's open to application now. And everything is paid for, flight, everything. Um, so, um, But at any rate, um, what we did is we brought these people in. And we thought that they'd be coming to talk about um, you know, they have junior faculty coming up, and they want to promote and tenure them, and they don't know how to deal with what they're doing, so they come to find out to get help. Well, it turns out they came because they all wanted to make cluster hires, a lot of them, in digital humanities. That was really exciting to us, and they ha they're advertised now um, in MLA. I don't know who else. I know some cluster hires have failed. I know the Univers University of Michigan cluster hire failed. Um, Northeastern is doing one now. Nebraska is doing one now. But they're coming, and it's, it's basically to it's, it's hard, as we know, to do digital work alone. And so if you bring a cluster of people in, you not only have people to work with and collaborate with, but you have people who can understand what you're doing and explain it to other people. Because um, when you explain it, it sounds like mea culpa or something. <laughs> uh, so. Is that it? Oh, yeah, Rich. Yeah, I actually think um, I think it's a really exciting time because I think it's really easy to do at this moment. I think there are all kinds of programs that are pretty well funded where you can go and you can apply for grants and go places. Uh, that's pretty much how I got my education because um, Miami was not really a hotbed of digital humanities. Um, and so I think um, it's a really exciting time, but I do think that there need to be many, many more structures for encouraging people to, um, to launch out on digital scholarship and digital forms of scholarship. The CLEAR report um, is, that, that talks about digital humanities centers, talks about them as siloing professors, just helping single professors with digital projects in their institutions. And so one effort, I think, of digital humanities centers now, the creation of CenterNet by Neil Freistat, for instance, um, it is an attempt to broaden the scope of these centers to really help them get projects launched. I'd actually like to have my center offer a consulting service where um, scholars who need XSLT but work at an institution that has no one who can do it can um, get the XSLT help and either pay back in kind by TEI encoding or proofing or whatever they can possibly do with their time, or writing us into a grant, whether they get it or not is irrelevant, um, or you know, um, or getting a grant and paying us, but but some form of um, so that I can show my bosses at my institution that I'm doing this for a reason. But also, we can really sort of spread the wealth and get um, get. You know, not every institution needs an XSLT expert. Maybe one for every 500 would do. So it's a way to really share. I think. 